number, well, welcome to week number five, I believe. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind you really quickly about uh, the hackathon that's coming up. It's uh, that you're going to just create a project based on a theme. It's from uh, the 13th to the 19th. That's when it's open. I'll be posting the link in the chat for all of those who want to sign up, or you can just scan the QR code right here. Okay. So we do have quite a bit to get through today. So uh, we're going to be going over three topics. We're going to be going over uh, China, Japan, and the Mongols. So uh, let's get started. All right. So we're going to start going over the Tang and Song dynasty. So the Sui dynasty was 581 to 618 AD. It reunited China, strong military, and revived civil service, and it reintroduced examinations based on Confucianism. There was also the Grand Canal, which, connect, which connected uh, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. The Tang Dynasty was 618 to 906, and it replaced the Sui Dynasty, which uh, the last emperor was despot. And the Tang family had connections to Turkic nomads. Emperor Taizong extended the Chinese rule into Central Asia and Chinese influence, extended to Tibet, Korea, and Vietnam as well. This was also the revival of long distance trade and the capital, which became a cosmopolitan character, foreigners from India, Central Asia, and Japan. So the emperor had the intellectual curiosity of many other religions like mosques, churches, and synagogues in, Ch in uh, the cosmopolitan city next to the Buddhist pagodas and Taoist and Confucian temples. So the emperor also founded academies to train bureaucrats, and he revived the cult of ancestor worship at imperial tombs, as well he supported uh, Taoism and Buddhism. So the monk, uh, monk Xuanzang, travels to India to bring back Buddhist texts. This is a picture you can take a look at of the giant wild goose pagoda built in uh, 652 CE, or it was originally within uh, Buddhist monetary, an example of ancient architecture. And this was the uh, layout of the city. So you can see they've got the imperial city, the administrative city, palace, market, garden, the gates on the outside. This is the layout of Kyoto in Japan. So Empress Wu in, uh, from 625 to 705, and then she, she ruled uh, 690 to 705, and uh, her relation with Buddhism. So she was a concubine of Emperor Taizong, and she married his son. As the Emperor, Dow Emperor Dowager, she controlled affairs in the background. So she made herself officially Empress in 690. She supported Buddhism, large land grants to monasteries, and had herself portrayed as a Bodhisattva, which we learned about a couple of classes ago, uh, the, icon the icons of Buddhism. The Buddhist Sutra found prophesy, prophesizing arrival of a female deity under whose rule the realm would prosper. In 845 began a persecution of Buddhism and Buddhists, so Buddhist lands did not have to pay taxes. So thousands of monks and nuns had to leave the monastic life. Millions of acres were seized and all metal statues were seized and melted to make coins. During this time, culture and technology was very important. So the drinking of tea became popular. Women and men both began to play polo. The spread of Chinese culture came to East, uh, Eastern Asia, like Korea, Japan, Vietnam. Woodblock printing made more books available. Astronomical clocks using escapement mechanisms, which meant they transferred the rotation into back or forth motion. And the use of natural gas to fire ovens for iron production. The Tang foreign policy uh, set the foundation for many other foreign policies in the future, and it controlled parts of Central Asia, which were lost to Arabs in the Battle of Talus in 751 CE. They also had a tributary system, which was the emperor and neighboring states would exchange gifts with each other. Kingdoms would pay tribute like Kashmir, Nepal, Japan, Korea, and Champa in Vietnam, and the employment of Turkic mercenaries alliances, and alliances with Turks were used to secure northern borders. The decline of the Tang happened, uh, began during the Anxi Rebellion in 755 to 763. It undermined the power of the central government and it gave rise to regional military governors, which meant they have the right to tax, the right to raise an army, to pass on the power to the heirs. 
impoverished peasants also had to sell their land to nobles and disastrous harvests in the late 9th century caused by droughts, floods, and the government uh, failed response to them led to uh, the rebellion in 874 to 884 CE and the 907 deposition of the last Tang emperor by a warlord. This is a map you can take a look at of um, the conquered areas during the Tang dynasty, 700 CE Tang dynasty. So a picture of some amber brown glazed pottery, picture, a figure of a horse from the Tang dynasty, and a polo player, a female polo player. Some more art. The Song Dynasty was 960 to 1278 CE, and it reunite, reunited China after a short period of disunity. So this meant they had to pay tribute to northern nomadic dynasties, Liao and Jin, and, then, and they were never as powerful as the Tang Dynasty. Although they did have a very large standing army, about 1 million, and their, the expansion of bureaucracy from about 30,000 to 400,000, uh, civil service began to replace the system of warlords. Over half of the bureaucrats had a father who had never been one himself. This is the Northern Song Dynasty. It's a map of them from uh, 960 to 1127. And this is the Southern Song Dynasty from 1127 to 1279. As for economic expansion, new rice from Vietnam led to the doubling of population to about 120 million people and many large cities had over 500,000 inhabitants. So the export of silk, porcelain, and lacquer ware were very important. They were manufactured items, and production was controlled by the state. It meant exporting via sea routes, land routes, which were, con land routes were controlled by enemies and were therefore uh, not possible to use. Large, large junks with up to six masts, up to 1,000 tons, using a compass to navigate, and a banking system with paper money. Technology, so these, this dynasty had the highest production of iron worldwide. Printing led to a sharp rise in literacy and it spread technological, but also Confucian religious texts and gunpowder was used for military purposes. An astronomical machine Kaifeng and, sol and the solar year was, could be calculated within four seconds. This is a Chinese mechanical and horological engineering from the Song Dynasty. It's likely the same astronomical machine. This is the paper money of the Song Dynasty. Some movable printing. The Chinese Renaissance made uh, less contacts to and interest in foreign ideas. So this made, made for the revival of traditional Chinese thinking. Uh, Neo-Confucianism, which incorporated Taoist and Buddhist ideas into Confucianism to make it more spiritual. And uh, the interpretation of Confucianism used as a basis for examinations until about the 20th century. And so an intellectual interest in Buddhism dwindled as it became more spiritual. Society. As for society, women became more secluded. This is when uh, the uh, the action of foot-binding began. So the remarrying of widows was increasingly frowned upon and Neo-Confucian ideas restricted the social mobility of women, which meant moving uh, between class, between the lower class and the higher class. However, women did gain the right to control their dowry and inherit the property. And the rise of wealthy merchant classes in cities began and efforts to strengthen peasants through a land reform also began to rise which meant this meant land from the aristocracy to, present, aristocracy to peasants to create a more taxable land. This is a landscape painting called uh, Autumn Colors on Rivers and Mountains from the Song Dynasty. Another painting. Another painting called Streams and Mountains with a Clear Distant View. Now a Japanese landscape painting. And this is an image of foot binding, of what would happen to the foot. All right. So uh, 
after we've done all that, come up with an argument and support it with evidence. What is the cause? So between 12, 600 and 1270 CE, Confucianism continued to influence the Chinese political system. So come up with an argument on this and uh, come, up with an, come up with some evidence. So what was the causes of, like how did Confucianism influence the Chinese political system during this time period? You can go ahead, uh, post your argument or your evidence in the chat, in the Q&A, or you can raise your hand and keep it up for just long enough so I can allow you to talk. We'll take about four minutes to do this. You can go ahead, uh, you can put it in the chat, you can put it in the Q&A, or you can just raise your hand. I'm going to have the participants tab open. Uh, you can raise your hand and I will allow you to talk so you can tell us your answer. All right. 
not getting any answers, but uh, continue to think about this. This can be something that's useful for your homework, for your essays, um, for uh, your short answer questions. This is really a main point and a guiding question for the rest of this lesson. So let's move on. I'm not gonna provide you with an answer because I really want you to think about this. Okay. Now let's move on to Japan. Okay, Japan in uh, 600 CE to 1450 CE. Keep in mind, we are still in the first time period in the first era of world history. So Japan in this time period had many Chinese influences, which was expeditions to China led by the prince who wrote uh, in 572 to 622 CE and he wrote the 17 article constitution. Uh, the, pro the proclamation of a Japanese ruler as a Chinese style emperor and how both Buddhism and Confucianism were encouraged how the ruler should show moral quality and in later years, decades, and later decades, Chinese court rituals and rankings for officials were added, even though there was no examination system and the Chinese style university trained only sons of aristocrats. So for the Heian era, which is uh, 794 to 1185, aristocracy dominated life at court. So they spent their day in pursuing beauty and pleasure and both men and women tried to excel at playing instruments. They wrote poems like the haiku. Men were also expected to read and write Chinese. So does anyone know uh, the format of a haiku? The number of lines, syllable count. Does anyone know? Someone it works. is very short, like two or three lines. Two or three lines. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, you have three lines in a haiku, and uh, it's a five, seven, five. So thank you for answering that question. Yes, so this included men were also expected to read and write Chinese. There was also the Prince Genji, and emperors were more and more influenced by Fujiwara family and the Buddhist monasteries. So art was very, very important in a feudal Japan. The rise of the provincial warrior elite. So provinces were not controlled by the central government, but they were only controlled by warlords. They lived in fortresses and they had everything from the smithies to the granaries. Warlords also administered public works, collected taxes for themselves. Bandits and warlords just dominated the life in Japan and Buddhist monasteries employed soldiers to defend themselves and to attack the rivals. Here's a picture of a castle. Samurai were the soldiers supporting the warlords and they had a strict code of honor and military prowess. And they were, uh, they were dis if they were disgraced, they would be removed. So peasants were served, were serfs. They were not allowed to bear arms, ride horses, wear certain clothes. And artisans were concentrated at Kyoto almost as powerless as peasants. This is a drawing, some art of a Japanese uh, samurai. You can take a look at uh, the clothing, the weaponry. The shogunate was from 1192 CE to 1867, and it was in the 12th century that when the civil war beat between the most powerful aristocratic families. So the Minamoto family wins and the feudal, feudal age in Japan begins and the shogun was the military leader in Japan. So the capital at Kamakura near uh, modern day Tokyo and the emperor was powerless. Towards the 14th and 15th century rise of merchant class organizing guilds, uh, women could participate in guilds, sometimes inherit businesses. Women and nobility lost their property rights though, uh, which was primogeniture and they are used to form alliances with marriage. They are expected to put honor of family above their own personal lives. As for culture, Zen Buddhism uh, pushed contemplation, a highly disciplined form of meditation 
and introverted simplicity and discipline. So Shintoism was the way of the gods, the worship of spirits, which was animism. Uh, the Mount Fuji was the home of spirits, shrines in nature, the Tenno goddess of the sun, the Tenno descendants of the sun goddess Amaratsu, and Chinese paintings and architecture were imitated. As we said before, uh, feudal Japan took on a lot of aspects of Chinese culture. This is a famous landmark, the Tori, the gate marking the entrance to a sacred space. Here's a painting from Song China that we've seen. It's uh, streams and mountains with a clear distant view. Some more art. The Golden Pavilion in Kyoto, also very popular uh, tourist spot, very popular landmark. The Rock Garden at Rionji. Look at the look at the way it's presented. All right. So now that we've got that, uh, we're going to move on to uh, the Mongols. So before we uh, continue, we want to know how does the Song Dynasty differ from the Tang Dynasty politically, economically, culturally, and socially? You can pick one of these to answer. You can go ahead, raise your hand, answer it in the Q&A, answer it in the chat. Just a quick warm up before we get started on the Mongols. I'll give you all about five, five-ish minutes at around 4.33. We can get back and take a look at all the answers and what we thought about it.
Again, you can just go ahead, you can put it in the chat, you can put it in the Q&A, or you can even just raise your hand. I have the participants tab open and I can allow you to talk. All right, so I've gotten two answers. One person said, uh, politically, the, the Song Dynasty was not as strong as the Tang Dynasty. That's, that is very correct. That is one of the main points, main differences between the Song and the Tang Dynasty. Uh, the, Song, the Tang Dynasty was extremely powerful in their military. They conquered a lot of territory, and the Song Dynasty was much, much weaker. Uh, good job on that observation. Someone else said there was a different ruling clan. Yes, that is correct as well. As for culturally and socially, uh, a lot more of a political, a lot of a so, more of social classes happening. Uh, someone said uh, the ruling family surname was different while well, that of the Song Dynasty. Okay, that is also correct. As for economics, a different economic system, more complex economic system was uh, displayed in the Song Dynasty. Song Dynasty was also later. The Tang Dynasty came first, Song Dynasty came second. All right, now moving on to the Mongols. So the beginning of, beginnings of the Mongols were at pastoral nomads in Mongolia. So they were organized in clans and tribes and they fought as part of, a daily, of their daily life. They were superior as horseback warriors. So they were unified by Taimujin in 1206 and he took the title of Genghis Khan. And this also, the religions included shamanism and Buddhism. This is Genghis Khan. So the Mongol Empire under Genghis Khan. So there was the conquest of the Tangut Empire in Central Asia the conquest of northern China, which was the Jin Empire, and if a city resisted, everybody was slain and only artists and scholars were spared. If a town surrenders, only a tribute has to be, only a tribute has to be paid. So their capital was Karakoram. The Mongol war machine. So the use of heavy and light cavalry, spies, and the later use of engines and cannons made the Mongols uh, very apt in war. They were also other uh, Famous technique was also feigning defeat and then the ambushing the enemy, and they were very well organized and used flags in battle to give commands. They were also very mobile. They covered up to 90 miles, uh, 90 square miles a day. Their composite bows had a range of 300 yards, and they had a multi-ethnic army, including Chinese, Persians, and uh, sometimes Turks. This is, a, this is a painting of their uh, siege warfare that the Mongols would use often. They were also superior horseback warriors as an example of fighting on horseback. So the empire after Chinggis Khan. So his sons fought uh, campaigns in Russia, the Middle East, Central Asia, and China. So in Russia, it was called the Golden Horde. In the Middle East, it was the Ilkhan Empire. In China, it was the Yuan Dynasty, and in Central Asia, it was the Jigatai Empire. This is a map of all the areas they conquered. So as you can see, well, let me try and annotate this. The Mongol The 
the Mongol campaigns before 1240 were are in green, the after 1240 are in purple, and the route of Marco Polo is in uh, pink to just show you a comparison of how much they moved. As you can see, they, they start here in the capital, Mongolia, Karakoram. They move into the Himalayas, into the Ilkhan Empire, so, uh, the Middle Eastern area, move into Moscow, Bulgar, Kiev. They go down to the Southern Song Dynasty on occasion. They move upwards into Japan. They move into uh, Eastern Europe. They move into Arabia, sometimes Africa. Go down to Delhi, Burma, and uh, Khmer. This is a picture of Kublai Khan. So the Mongol impact on China so all of China was conquered by Kublai Khan in the Yuan Dynasty in 1271 to 1368. So they tried to conquer Japan twice, but the Mongol fleet was destroyed by a typhoon or a kamikaze, and the rest of the Mongol Empire was defeated by samurai. And the new capital became Beijing. Their impact on China included, uh, went into their uh, economics as well. So they kept the Chinese system of tax collecting and governing, but foreigners, first Mongols and the other Central Asians had uh, higher positions in government. And the Chinese were only at the local and the regional level. Chinese were also barred from learning Mongol and, inter and intermarriage. Marriage between uh, Chinese and, Mongol and the Mongols were outlawed. Scholar gentry also resented the Mongols. Improvements in transportation and widespread use of paper money also happened. There was an increase in foreign trade, the Pax Mongolica, and an economic boon, boom under the early Yuan. So a later plague, corruption, factionalism, and xenophobia led to the fall of the Yuan Dynasty. Does anyone know what these words mean? Does anyone know what factionalism and xenophobia mean? If you don't, that's all right. I can explain them. Well, xenophobia is a uh, sort of racism, like a, an, an opposition to the other, an opposition to foreign people, and factionalism is sort of like classism. Those all led to the fall of the Yuan Dynasty. So in 1368, uh, the Ming Dynasty uh, became, came to rule, and it ruled till uh, 1643, and the Chinese cultural practices remained unbroken, which meant the revival of Neo-Confucianism and uh, civil service examination. The Mongol impact on the Middle East came into the Seljuk Turks being defeated. As we saw, uh, I think, in the last class, the Seljuk Turks were, came, came into the southern areas, came into uh, Central Asia, and they began to conquer a, lot of, uh, conquer a lot of land. And the Mongols came and pushed them back, so the Seljuk Turks were defeated. Turkic groups were pushed into Anatolia, which became the new Ottoman Empire. And in 1258, Baghdad was destroyed, the last caliph was killed, and 200,000 people were killed, according to the Halal Khan. This also included widespread destruction, and Iraq ceased to be the center of the Islamic world, and the Mongol onslaught was stopped by the Mamluk dynasty in Egypt, who built a strong centralized state based entirely on a fear of Mongols. The Mongols also founded the Ilkhan dynasty that ruled the Middle East and which had their center in Persia. And there were heavy taxes, heavy taxes and farmland began, became turned to pastures and only, and only the wine and silk industry flourished. The Ilkhan rulers converted to Islam, uh, Shiite, uh, Shiite Islam, and Persian became more, became more influential. So Mongols began to intermix with Persian and the Turkic population and there were no Mongol uh, cultural traces. The Mongol impact on Russia included the Mongols to completely destroying the Kievan Rus. So uh, Russia isolated from Europe, trade declined, and the only loose control by and there was only loose control by Mongols. So there were yearly tributes collected by Moscow, and Mongols and their Turkic ally, allies became uh, Muslims. So there was no intermixing with the Russian population either. Although the Mongols had uh, loose control on Russia, they had control in Russia, they had only yearly tributes of uh, vague relation. Mongol impact on Russia extended to Moscow becoming stronger, a centralized government first to collect tribute and then to organize a fight against Mongols. 
So they renounced the Tatar overlordship by 1480, and they pushed Mongols into the east. So peasants had to pay twice to the boyars, the Russian, or the Russian nobles, and then to the Mongols. So serfdom began to increase. The Orthodox Church also strengthened, tax exempt. It's famously known that the Mongols were one of the only groups to be, to be able to uh, conquer Russia in the winter. Uh, the growth of Russia from the 1300 to 1796, you can see this is a map. They've got everything mapped out over here. The Principality of Moscow, the Grand Principality of Moscow, and then under all the rulers, the Queen Anna, Elizabeth, Catherine II, Boris Godunov, Romanov, Alex Alexis, um, Alexievich, Ivan IV, Vasily III, and Ivan III. It's color code is quite a complex map. You don't need to know all of this. It's just to give you a general idea of how much was controlled by the Mongols of the Empire of Russia. You can also see here they've got the Cossacks. And then uh, the Ottoman Empire, you can see that stretching in there. As for the global impact of the Mongols, there was an exchange of ideas, which included gunpowder, paper, paper money, and awareness of other cultures, like global, global, global trade grew, and Marco Polo, which was reports about paper money, use of coal, safe and wealthy China under Mongol rule, and the international diplomacy on the rise, which were letters exchanged between the Pope and the Great Khan. Uh, Il Khan offered the alliance to crusaders in 1287, and the spread of disease. So plague spread along the Silk Road with Mongol armies, and it killed about 30% of Chinese and European population in the mid 1300s. I'll let you go back, take a look at this map again, consider what we've just looked at. Just take a look at the map, look at the, uh, make sure to look at the key at the bottom to understand uh, the, to understand the land. So again, look at the global impact, very important part of the Mongol dynasty, very important part of the Mongols themselves. Uh, okay. So if you remember uh, last week I assigned homework, I assigned some homework, it was a, I'll pull it up. It was a uh, table that you were to fill out um, regarding the spread of Islam, the interactions between Islam and the rest of the rest of the world. Hold on. Let me get it open. <clears throat> okay. So this was, this is what the table looked like. Did, does anyone have any questions about what we did last week about, uh, about this table in particular, about Anatolia, West Africa, Spain, South Asia, the Sultanate, Seljuks, Mali, any of it? anything at all.
Are there any questions at all for what we did last year? No? All right. So uh, we're gonna take, we're gonna start taking a look at some of the questions that you might get on the AP test. We're gonna talk about uh, the Mongols. Let's open it up. Let's open up the short answer questions. Here we go. So here is uh, some of the textbook practice. We have a passage right here using this passage in your knowledge of world history. Answer all parts of the question that follows. Right now we'll just do um, we'll just do part A. You can go ahead, put your answer, I'll open up the chat. You can put your answer in the chat. You can put your answer in Q and A, or you can go ahead, raise your hand, and I can call on you for answers. So this is uh, the passage that you were asked to analyze. Never before had a civilization suffered so suddenly, so devastating a blow. The barbarian conquest of Rome had been spread over two centuries. Between each blow and the next, some recovery was possible. And the German re conquerors respected, some tried to preserve the dying empire, which they helped to preserve, the dying empire they helped to destroy. But the Mongols came and went within 40 years. They came not to conquer and stay, but to kill, pillage and carry their spoils to Mongolia. When their bloody tide ebbed, it left behind a fatally disrupted economy, canals broken or choked, schools and library, libraries in ashes, governments too divided, poor and weak to govern, and a population cut in half and shattered in soul. This is written by historian Will Durant on the Mongol con conquest. He wrote this in 1950. Part A asks you to, I'll go ahead and highlight this. Does identify one piece of evidence that supports the author's claim about the nature of Mongol conquests. Well, that's not. So you can go ahead, uh, post what your belief is in the chat. Post. Uh, you can even go ahead and just tell me the line number. Say that it was uh, the first line, second line, third line, whichever. But uh, post in the chat. Post it in the Q and A. Raise your hand and tell me just which one would you answer. These are actual questions that will be uh, that are actual examples, like from the AP tests, which you would be taking at the end of the course. So I encourage you to try and answer these. We'll we'll take about uh, five minutes until about four fifty five.
go ahead like I said any answers accepted whatever you think um, we'll talk about it at the end in about at about 455 you can put it in the Q&A you can raise your hand I've got the participants tab open or you can put it in the chat I've opened up the chat for you I haven't gotten any answers, but what I got for my answer was line seven. So if you take a look at line seven, it says, within 40 years, they came not to conquer and stay, but to kill. And that makes it clear the uh, intention, the nature of the Mongol conquest, which were very violent and uh, not caring about the people. So the next part says, explain how one piece of evidence that challenges the author's claim that the Mongols accomplished little more than destruction and ruin. We'll only take about three, min three minutes on this. And um, after that, we can talk about what's, what's in the plans for next week. So you can go ahead and put this one in the chat, put it in the Q&A, or I have the participants tab open. You can raise your hand, keep it up long enough for me to recognize it. We'll talk about it, talk about our answers at 4.58.
may not have any answers for this one either, but the one piece of evidence that, chall that challenges the author's claim that the Mongols accomplished little more than destruction and ruin, um, we would talk about how it le left behind a fatally disrupted economy. It's not exactly entirely accurate. The Mongols did the Yuan, under the Yuan Dynasty. The Mongols uh, increased the economy, made it a lot better. Okay, so that's just about it. Just about all the practice we've got for today. Uh, just a reminder about the, hold on, let me pull it up. About the homework, this will be going on the, um, this will be going on the Google Drive. Here we just have China, society and gender structure. Then we've got uh, Japan, society and gender structure. We talk about the Tang Song Ming dynasties before 1180 during the Shogunate. Here is politics before 1180 during the Tang Dynasty, interactions between cultures, uh, culture itself, the economy and trade, uh, the techniques of the administration, society and gender structure, economy and trade, and moving on to Russia, the Middle East, and some true or false questions for you to think about. This will be going on the on the drive. So does anyone have any questions over what we learned today, anything at all? Just any anything you're wondering about, um, just on the content we learned today, on the information that we'll be learning, that we learned about. There's nothing at all. Oh, where do we find the AP exam examples? Okay, so the AP exam examples they can be found online if you're looking if you're looking them up. You can just go ahead and search. Um, the, a WAP, make sure to search for that 1200 update. What I'm using is I'm using the textbook. So if you are taking the type, if you are uh, taking the class, like in, if you're taking the class in real life with a teacher and sitting in the classroom, I highly recommend using the school, using a school provided textbook or uh, purchasing or renting the textbook. It's the best resource you could possibly find. And there are so many examples and there's a lot of practice in those textbooks. The homework will be due next week. It's going to be on the Google Drive. You can look at it, you can uh, use the textbook if you need information from that. You can definitely use some of the resources we talked about in the first class, like the AP World of PDA and such. All right. If there are no more questions, that's it for this class, class number five. And um, I'll see you all next week. Make sure to think about the essential questions of the unit.